I've had a couple of deep conversations over the weekend. One of them was with the father of three, who's almost 40 years old. He's as smart a guy as you can possibly meet as you go along the road to life. Thoughtful, sincere, very, very well read, and deeply concerned. He was, in fact, the first person that really made an argument that it may be too late already to stop the catastrophe that's coming. I thought about that. In fact, it made me a bit sleepless. The reality is, in real life, and that is where we live, there are consequences to craziness, insanity, madness, intimations towards violence. The simple truth is, there are 330 million people that live in the United States, and astounding percentages of them cannot tell you what the First Amendment is, don't know what the American Revolution was fought over, have no idea what side was what with regard to the Civil War, don't know much about World War II or the Civil Rights Movement, and don't know who the Vice President is. There's a book that was written a long time ago, really a collection of essays. It was called The Federalist Papers, and it's a primer for what happens in a society, a republic, if the people don't care, if they have lassitude, they're apathetic, indifferent. There is something that it seems a lot of Americans don't understand, even though they may be indifferent. There is no indifference on the part of those who would prey on that indifference to take power for themselves, for their selfish causes. That's exactly what happened in Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu is one of the world's most incompetent leaders of government, along with being one of its most corrupt. Here is how Benjamin Netanyahu stayed in power. He made a deal with the extremists, and the extremists did everything they could to incite the Palestinians. Bibi Netanyahu did everything he could to consolidate his power and to grant himself as prime minister a license to steal and to commit corrupt acts. Because he was accused of crimes, what he sought to do politically was to undo the independent Israeli judiciary. No democracy survives without an independent judiciary. And in the United States, a deep, deep, deep marker of our corruption and decay is in the corruption of the United States Supreme Court through people like Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. But back in Israel, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets to protest, to protest the attacks on democracy. They protested weekend after weekend after weekend. Over the course of a year, time and time again, Israeli national security officials warned the country was becoming vulnerable to attack because it looked weak. Weakness invites aggression. And then Hamas struck. And now the war has come. The war that is about to launch in Gaza is extremely dangerous. There is a Chinese naval task force that is arriving in the Middle East. There's a Russian naval presence. Most Americans don't know that an American destroyer was involved in sustained combat operations, shooting down Iranian drones shot from their Houthi allies in Yemen, aimed at Israel. The world is a powder keg, ready to explode. And just weeks ago, it wasn't so. The implications of Benjamin Netanyahu's incompetence and the weakness that was seen as a result of it and the aggression that it inspired by a great evil, as evil as ISIS, is something every American should appreciate. Because now there are two 
American Air Force carrier strike groups off the coast of Israel. Two million Gazans who live lives essentially in an open air prison run by Hamas are under grave, grave humanitarian threat. These are human beings. They are made just like the Jews and the Christians in God's image. And their suffering is not to be disregarded. There is nothing that anybody can do to stop the war that is coming. Hamas will be eliminated by Israel. They will certainly try to, at least. The danger of this war escalating on the northern border or in the West Bank is profound. The United States is just two steps away from direct confrontation with Iran. These are the consequences of these years of insanity. There's a simple truth about human history. Each successive century has been deadlier than the last. The 17th century deadlier than the 16th. The 18th more so than the 17th. The 19th deadlier than the 18th until things went truly off the rails in the 20th. And by the middle of the 20th century, man possessed all the weapons he needed to extinct humanity from the face of the earth. More than 100 million people died, killed violently in the Second World War. Douglas MacArthur talked about this from the battleship Missouri anchored in Tokyo Bay when the guns fell silent after years of war. He talked about the fact that mankind had reached the abyss and that if humans could not figure out how to live with one another and to establish a permanent peace, then surely we were at the end of civilization. What MacArthur said was that since the beginning of time, people have killed each other and people have sought to make peace with one another. And up until that time, all of the institutions that had ever been imagined between governments had failed to keep the peace. And the war that came would be the last war between human beings that did not end the human race. Since then, there have been many wars fought across the globe. In fact, there has not been a single day of peace since that day on earth where no one was fighting. But what we have avoided is a great power confrontation. War between the countries that have the technological and military capacities to wipe out everybody on the earth. And those countries and those weapons are drawn closer together in the Middle East. Here at home in the United States, there is a carnival of idiocy reigning supreme on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. Imagine 100 years from now, our descendants looking back as the winds of catastrophe are stirring, trying to understand the idiocy of this age, the tolerance for it by the American people in a moment of real crisis on the edge of real consequences. Imagine how they will judge us. Imagine what the historians will say. We are in a most dangerous hour. What's happening in Washington, D.C. is obscene. The fact that Donald Trump, who incited an insurrection, who lied about the results of an election, a man found guilty of sexually abusing a woman by a jury of his peers, this man who tried to burn down the U.S. Constitution, defended by the blood sacrifice of one million Americans, is 50 points ahead in the Republican primary, and he's winning in a head-to-head -head race against Joe Biden? What national sickness 
does that reveal? What decay does that expose? What rot are we dealing with? This country, the greatest in the world, founded on an idea, made up by all the people of the world, is humanity's greatest hope. We have fed more people, cured more people, liberated more people than all of the other nations put together since the beginning of time. We are not a perfect country, but the idea of America is a noble one. Yet, in 2023, where is the nobility in defense of it? Where are the people who will stand up and say, enough? The hour is drawing short. They must stand up. You must stand up. We must all stand up against this madness. Our children should live in peace and hope and prosperity, not under the threat of war and chaos, suffering and death. That this moment has come, understand, was brought by politics and corruption and selfishness. We're all tied together. And anybody who tells you we're not is a fool. The corruption of one man in Israel has brought the whole world to the brink of war because his corruption and weakness stirred evil. And when evil sees weakness, it strikes. And that evil has yoked a million Palestinians to it. They don't care about the lives of those people, but Americans should, because America is a country founded on an idea about human rights that though we have lived imperfectly, we now understand includes all people, all people. That's the American position. And it would be better if more Americans understood it.